morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, this week's edition of Java with John. Uh, Java with John is being broadcast live on uh, YouTube TV or YouTube Live, Acton TV's channel, and it's also being broadcast on 94.9 FM radio. Uh, if you're in Acton, you can hear that uh, within our town boundaries. Uh, we have some special guests this morning, which I'm looking forward to hearing from and, and speaking with. And, and um, But before we get started, I just wanted to give a few updates. Um, so this Job with John program is a senior center program that we've been running for about a year at the senior center. And it's usually in person and it's usually with a room full of seniors and we have a great conversation and give some updates on town business and then get a lot of great questions and answers. Uh, since we're not able to do that, uh, we're gonna, we've are gonna we been doing it virtually and uh, we've been doing it the last few weeks and we'll continue to do it. Um, so just a few updates that I would normally give uh, at the senior center. Uh, as, you, as you would imagine, most of our work and the organization is focused on uh, preventing COVID-19 from spreading and taking several measures, uh, both internally and in the community to try to help uh, our community deal with this crisis. Uh, I have to say that um, our boards and committees are doing great work Our selectmen and, and board of health are providing great leadership uh, to help us uh, navigate through this, but our staff, we have staff that are providing tremendous service under very difficult circumstances and it's our first responders are out there every day, uh, all night and every day uh, dealing with this uh, directly. Uh, our nursing staff is dealing with it around the clock. Uh, a lot of people are out there working that you wouldn't even realize every day. Uh, and it's all contributing to a great uh, uh, operations uh, despite the circumstances. So I'm really proud of the work that we're doing here in Acton. Um, I think just a couple of things, the Board of Selectmen, um, postponed our state election, our town election, and uh, to align with the state election, which will be June 2nd. We're encouraging people to vote by mail, uh, which you can do by going to actinma.gov slash elections. You can fill out an application to get a, a ballot mailed to you, ballots mailed to you. So I, we recommend you do that. Um, they also, the board, the board of selectmen also voted to extend the tax bill deadline. Uh, property taxes are due May 1st uh, this, this, this quarter, but they've extended that deadline to June 1st. Uh, to give people more time and they've also uh, taken the action to waive any penalties and fees or interest uh, on those due payments as long as they're made by june 30th so if you're late on june 1st uh, as long as you get it in by june 30th there won't be any penalties uh, as it would be otherwise uh, we're also uh, implementing some changes at the transfer station um, that's an essential service and our public works employees are doing a great job of keeping that running we really encourage residents to honor social distancing practices when you're there. Um, we, want, we want to keep our employees safe, so please keep separation from them if you need to interact with them and uh, try to limit what you're doing over there to just trash and recycling so we can get through this. Uh, to try to help spread people out, we've actually opened it six days a week now. Uh, and our, our hours are 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And the first hour of every day is dedicated to seniors if you wanted to get there and, and get your trash and recycling taken care of early before the crowds get through. Uh, there's a lot of other things going on and we encourage you to follow our website for daily updates. ActonMA.gov slash COVID-19 is where you'll get a great amount of information. So uh, this is Job with John on 94.9 FM and uh, I'm really excited to welcome uh, our first guest, our state representative, Representative Tammy Govea. Uh, she has some uh, some items to share with an update from Beacon Hill, and, and hopefully we'll have some time to uh, have some questions and answers with her as well. Good morning. All right. Great. Good morning. Thank you for having me, uh, Town Manager John Andretti, and for everybody who's tuning in today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with residents of Acton uh, directly about things that have been happening up on Beacon Hill. But first, I want to really reiterate what John has said about how proud um, I am and we all are to be in this community that's working really hard and working together um, to make sure that we're protecting as many of our residents as is humanly possible uh, given the pandemic that we're experiencing right now. Um, I've talked to numerous, numerous, numerous people about just how, um, set, how happy they are with the kinds of support that they're getting. And um, I wanna talk a little bit here about not only stuff that's happening, happening legislatively up on Beacon Hill, but even just all the interactions and how it's changed the nature of my work as your state representative. So I'll talk about that a little bit. 
Um, I know that this program is dedicated primarily to seniors and one of the things as a public health social worker, as well as a lawmaker that came to mind immediately is um, feeling really concerned and worried about isolation and what this does to our uh, sense of community as we're um, you know, been following the stay at home guidance that the governor has uh, put in place to protect um, all of us from the spread of COVID, but particularly our healthcare workers and our first responders. So please know that there are a lot of people who are thinking of all of you who are listening. And um, I know many of you uh, who are seniors who are listening and maybe others who are tuning in, you're also really, really worried about your, fa your family members and other people in our community. Um, we're a very fortunate community overall, uh, we're pretty privileged, but there are a number of people who are facing, um, you know, real uh, issues with housing and food access. And so right when COVID started, that's really where the community mobilized and has been working together to make sure that our little ones who need access to uh, food are getting access to food, that our seniors are getting access to nutritious meals as well. So there's been a whole host of things that we've really needed to pay attention to both at the state level as well as at the local level and just really proud of those efforts that have been going on. Um, for those of you who don't know, I have a master's in public health and a master's in social work. And so I've really been leaning into uh, my professional background as it relates to how I'm responding to this pandemic as a lawmaker and thinking a lot about um, and really early on encouraging the governor to be very clear in his directives around staying at home. And I'm so grateful to all of you who are following those directives um, and are taking them seriously and are working with your family members to take those uh, measures seriously as well. Um, I'm glad that you know we've closed down the, the parks in town and um, taken steps and measures to really protect people and send the message, particularly to our young people, that they are also part of the solution when it comes to um, mitigating the impact of the spread of coronavirus. Those were some concerns that I had very early on. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, I have a high schooler and a college student. And I, so as a parent, I know how challenging it really can be to um, pay attention to the mental health needs of our young people and our young adults um, and the fact that this is having a huge impact on their, um, their, their ability to act, interact socially and to engage in social emotional learning. And I want to thank our teachers as well. So for those of you who, you know, maybe don't have um, a young person in your life who is at one of our schools in Acton Boxborough, I've seen firsthand just how hard our teachers are working to do all that they can to provide um, as, as many opportunities for engaging in education um, while also making sure that we're not stressing our students out too much um, because of the mental health impacts of coronavirus and how we're responding. So all of these things I'm talking about at the local level and all of the state reps that I've been in communication with for the past five weeks have had the same sort of ongoing conversations with their constituents and with their residents. And that's informing legislation that's um, pending up at the state house. I will say though, that once the governor you know, put um, a, a state of emergency order in place, he then has the authority to pass on his own a lot of um, measures that don't need to go through the legislative process. Um, I personally have not been in the state house since March 9th. Um, I had events in the community on the 10th and then chose to basically self-isolate since March 11th. Um, the state house wasn't, didn't move to um, sort of like a stay at home, having only essential people for another week or so after that. But rest assured, we are not going into the state house for the most part. I have a couple colleagues who go in for uh, certain things, but um, I'm not going into the state house. And a lot of decisions are made much more informally and through communication between um, the leadership of the state house and the governor. So just know that if you're not hearing a ton of legislation coming out of the state house, it's because the governor has that authority given the state of emergency. 
But there have been a couple of things that the legislature has been involved in. And John has already talked about some of those, you know, being able to push out um, town meeting, being able to push out the elections. The reason for that is, you know, our democracy and elections are um, so critical to how we function as a democracy. Um, but we want to make sure that our elections are safe and that people can go and vote and with knowing that they are safe and that they're not going to, you know, potentially expose someone else to COVID or get it, or become exposed themselves. Um, so we've talked a lot about housing up at the state house. We've passed a couple bills related to uh, protecting renters in particular. Um, and just keep in mind that a lot of things really at this point have to come out of the federal level. And then the state is trying to figure out where do we fit in that. Um, you may hear a lot about unemployment and what the federal government has done through the CARES Act is expanded unemployment benefits to um, people who previously hadn't qualified for unemployment. So people who work as independent contractors or who work in the gig economy, um, but those have been very, those guidances from the federal government have been very slow to roll out to the state level. So we know that there are, you know, thousands of people in our state who still haven't been able to access unemployment benefits. And we are talking about that hourly up at the state house um, so that we can try to figure out ways to get cash assistance or get, you know, some sort of um, hard dollars into people's hands so that they can continue to pay their rent and mortgage, you know, buy groceries, keep diapers on their babies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, food access has been an issue. I've, I've been on a number of calls in town focused on food access and we are in just such a great place with the skills that we, the skilled staff that we have and the caring staff that we have here in town, both town employees as well as nonprofit organizations and the schools that have been coming together to really think through what does food access look like, um, you know, for our residents. and. You know, one of the reports that came out two days ago is that we are very likely to experience 25% unemployment in our state. And that has tremendous impacts on thinking about food security, housing security, et cetera, et cetera. There's just one other thing that I wanna highlight and then I think we can open it up to, um, you know, more questions um, is I'm thinking a lot about mental health and asking a lot of questions around mental health. Um, when I think about uh, what's happening with our frontline healthcare workers and what is likely to happen um, and what their experience will look like over the next couple of weeks, um, there have been ongoing conversations about how do we support our healthcare workers so that they can take care of the most sick of us, um, you know, within the hospital setting and then also the step down setting, um, but also thinking about the mental health of all of us. Um, we're all operating and working in very different ways. Um, you know, you're not able to meet uh, and come together at the senior center. And that has tremendous impacts on um, our ability to be able to connect with other people. So um, I've uh, been working on launching a program to reach out to seniors, to reach out to people in our community individually. And I have a team of folks who are ready to start making phone calls just to check in with people, see how you're doing, see if you need any particular resources. And I've been um, in co constant communication with the CEO of uh, Emerson Hospital and Christine Schuster and her team have been on this planning and working really hard to make sure that the hospital is uh, at the highest le level of capacity that they possibly can be uh, given what's going on with COVID. They have had tremendous support from the community, from the surrounding communities, and they are so incredibly grateful. Um, you may have heard that we were doing um, a, a sewing project to get hand-sewn masks for um, folks who work within Emerson and then also other community members. Over 10,000 masks were dropped off within a like two-week period over at Emerson Hospital. So the outpouring from the community has been just so uh, positively overwhelming for the, for the folks over at Emerson. But they do have enough PPEs, I'm happy to report. They have enough personal protective equipment over at Emerson Hospital and they feel like they have enough to get us through the next couple of weeks, which 
I'm incredibly relieved and grateful for. Um, and so just know that they are, that our community members who are reporting for work at, at Emerson um, should have all of the protective equipment that they need. We've been working really hard to make sure that our frontline, uh, our first responders, our police officers and firefighters, that they have the equipment they need. Um, and we're paying a lot of attention to what's called congregate care. So, you know, I have constituents who live in um, housing for people with disabilities um, or elder housing. And so making sure that we're doing all that we can um, to make sure that our social workers who are working with um, families and children are also protected. So these are the things that, you know, we're paying attention to up on Beacon Hill every single day. Um, but again, a lot of the directives are really held by uh, the governor. But um, I'm here to answer any questions you have about any particular pieces of legislation or programs um, that we have running or that we could be running or should be running. So I want to turn it back over to you, John, I think. Great. Well, well thank you very much, Representative, for the updates. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions for Representative Govea or for any of our other speakers, please email them into manager at actonma.gov. Uh, or there's a chat function on YouTube where you can also enter questions and we can see them that way. Uh, so we're here on uh, 94.9. We have a representative Govea, we have our uh, nursing director, Heather York, and we have our council and aging director, Sharon Mercurio. Uh, we're gonna have an update now from uh, nursing director, Heather York on the public health front. Heather, how are we doing today? Good morning, John, thank you. Um, and thank you, Tammy, your information was just really great for folks to know what's going on in the background throughout the community, but also throughout the state at that level. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to talk about a few things, um, a, a few things that are a little different today, um, particularly about our contact tracing. I know there's a lot of concern by folks in the community um, who will get co phone calls from their local board of health, which would be us, um, saying that they've been in contact and exposed to someone who is a positive case of COVID-19. And I just wanted to explain how that process works. Um, so if someone is having symptoms um, of COVID-19, a cough, a fever, shortness of breath, uh, some folks are seeing other symptoms like a sore throat, headache, body aches, and they go to their physician and the physician decides to have them tested or um, they've had to go to the emergency room. Once someone is tested, the turnaround time is about 24 to 48 hours now, depending on the lab that you're going to. I think some have still a, a little longer um, reporting time. What happens when that test comes back positive is the doctor who ordered the testing will get in touch with uh, the patient, let them know that they did test positive for COVID-19 and they will be put on home quarantine for 14 days, or if they live with other people, it's considered home isolation. So they need to isolate from their family as much as they can. From that point, what happens is the local boards of health are notified of this positive case. So if there's a case in Acton, um, I'll get updated through the MAVEN system, through the State Department of Public Health, and then what I do or my colleagues do is we call the resident and we do what's called contact tracing. So we have a conversation based on when their symptoms started. Um, we go through you know, a, a plethora of questions of how they're feeling, if they know they were exposed, where they work, if there's family members within the house. And then we start expanding outside of the family members. Who have you been in contact with? In, a, in less than a six foot distance for 15 minutes or greater. And that would be someone that would be considered a contact, a direct contact of a positive case. So then we get all of that information, phone numbers, addresses, towns they live in. Um, and then we start calling people to let them know they've been in contact with a positive case. Um, so if you, at not having a, any symptoms or not having been tested, get a call from your local board of health saying, 
you have been in, identified as someone that was in contact with a positive COVID-19 patient, we will start asking you the same questions. You will go on 14 day quarantine from the date of the exposure. And uh, from there, we'll monitor you um, from over the phone. We'll get in contact with you frequently just to see how you're feeling, make sure you're not having any symptoms, give you guidance on the quarantine itself, um, assess if you need assistance with food delivery or any of those things that um, you might need, medications. Um, so, and then we'll ask you all of the questions that we typically ask a patient who is positive and we go through that piece. Just a reminder, if I get a, um, if I get information of someone who is a contact case from another town, we don't get information about who the positive case is. Um, that information is protected as well as anyone who is a contact case. Um, your information doesn't go out. Um, no one is notified of who you are. And if you are a positive case, that is especially protected um, as someone could have, you know, 30 or 40 um, people they have been in contact with who have to be notified that they have, in fact, been um, around a positive COVID-19 case. So it does take a little bit of time for all of that information to be collected and out to you. Um, but just, you know, remember that your personal protected information is not given to anyone else. Um, we as clinicians can talk to other boards of health and other medical to a um, testing result or Heather, it looks like we're having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties with, with your feed there. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but we, we caught you right up until uh, you said talking about other medical uh, other boards oh, of health. Sure. So we we do discuss, um, you know, we have to discuss with other boards of health and physicians any information, um, but that doesn't go any farther than that. So I just wanted to explain how that tracing happens because it is a little confusing for people. Um, and people do ask, you know, who infected them, even though they're they're not a positive yet. Um, and that's not something that we can we can give out. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, I know with the new guidance for the face masks, um, for folks to wear those when they're out in the community, grocery shopping, going to the pharmacy, where it's it can be difficult to stay six feet away. I just want to remind people, you still want to socially distance even with a face mask on. Just because you have the face mask on does not mean that the social distancing has stopped. So that's still a really important piece to keep the spread of COVID-19 down. Uh, distance and masks will, will help us even more to keep that spread from, from continuing. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to mention was um, what, what Tammy had mentioned about, you know, being at home and being isolated and, and not getting out of the house. Um, you know, self-care is so important at this time. I encourage people, um, you know, if you don't know how to do a Zoom chat or a Facebook chat or an, um, a FaceTime, if you have grandchildren or children, have them talk you through it on the phone, you know, as best that they can. Ask them to write down directions for you and drop them off outside your house. It's good to be in contact with your relatives and your friends for your overall mental health. Um, so I think that's really important. So if you don't know how to do it, find someone who can who can walk you through that process. Um, you know, talking on the phone is great, but it's good to see people's faces. It's good to see and, you know, see people and, and laugh and, you know, see other reactions. It's, it's really important right now. Um, the other thing that I've, I've seen going on, um, there's a lot of online um, teaching or um, meetings, um, painting classes, sewing demonstrations, knitting classes, um, a lot of exercise classes. There's a lot of these things going on 
um, right on your computer. And if you have access for that, utilize it. Um, I know the Senior Center has done some exercise classes that are on Acton TV. Um, you know, so check Acton TV for activities, but there's a lot of things going on online that I think just helps folks, you know, have other outlets to reach out to the community and, and bring the community into their home. Thank you. Great, thank you for all the updates. Um, very important information about contact tracing. I'm sure people will find that valuable as they get phone calls, maybe in the coming days or weeks. Uh, so you brought up some good ideas for uh, how to connect with each other and <laughs> particularly concerned with our senior population uh, and their ability and availability of tools for them to do that. So your suggestion to contact others to help is a great idea. Uh, we have our next speaker is our director of the senior center, the council on aging director, Sharon Mercurio. She's been doing a lot of great work to try to continue engaging with seniors, even though people aren't allowed to come to the senior center, which is a, has been a challenge, but she's going to continue to do that. And, and she has some updates for us today on, on what's, what's new. So good morning, Sharon. Morning, John. Thank you everybody for doing this. Um, I know we're always concerned about the seniors that are not technologically savvy um, and don't have access to that um, format. So having the radio station and Acton TV has been really such a great benefit. Um, I wanted to remind people that even though the senior center is closed, the staff are still working remotely. So um, if you need anything, you have any questions, any concerns about yourself, about a loved one, please reach out to us and we will get back to you. Um, also wanted to focus a little bit today on um, financial situations because I, I know your financial situation may have changed overnight. Um, it, it's really devastating. Um, so to know that there are programs in place that you may qualify for, um, maybe in November when fuel assistance opened, you weren't eligible, but it could be that you are now. So deadline at this point is um, until April 30th. So please reach out. We can help you apply for fuel assistance. We can help you apply for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, nicknamed for SNAP. Um, and well, um, talking about SNAP as well, um, they've actually maybe reaching out if you're already receiving SNAP benefits, um, you may be seeing an increase in your benefits for April and May. Um, so it is not a scam if they call you or text you. Um, what they'll be saying is um, in response to COVID 19, you will be um, receiving extra SNAP benefits. So please know that that is real. Um, they will not be asking for any personal information, banking, social security numbers. Um, so to, to keep on your toes about that, but to know that is available. Um, as was mentioned before, there is a weekly group that talks about food access. So please know that Congregate meals uh, are available, grab and go, um, if you're you're eligible for that program. The Senior Center has also been working with Open Table and has frozen meals on hand. So if you want to stock up your freezer, um, I know groceries are kind of touch and go this, <laughs> this time. Um, you may not be able to get all you need. So to have that peace of mind knowing that you've got a couple of meals in the freezer. Um, that's available for you. Also, AB Schools has a wonderful program. They're doing bag lunches. Um, you call, you let them know you're coming, you can pick up a bag lunch um, or it can be delivered if you're not able to get out. So those things are available for you. Um, also to keep in mind, <coughs> sorry, for any of the online grocery delivery services um, to really plan ahead, um, which is hard to do. Um, I know last time I went shopping, I came home and my daughter said we should get another order in. I'm like, oh, good Lord. Um, but really, they're, they're looking probably about a week and a half or two weeks out. So even though right now you've got food in the fridge, it's not going to hurt to put in an order. You can change it up to 24 hours ahead of time. So um, just keep that in mind that that's something you can do. Um, and as, as Heather and Tammy both mentioned, so important to connect with people. So pick up the phone, reach out um, with family, friends, people that you knew from the senior center, um, 
try to get out in nature. You know, the weather's changing and, and sunshine and fresh air just mean the world. Just because you're self-isolating doesn't mean that you need to stay indoors. Um, and again, use social distancing and that sort of thing, but really nature can do the, you the world of good. Um, and again, we've been working very closely with Acton TV to try to get our, our programs, lectures, talks on, on that program for folks to watch. So we do have our um, playlist now on the front page of the Acton COA website. So you can see what programs will be shown when. Um, so our website is actoncoa.com. Um, and we've also been updating our online newsletter quite frequently. So there's a tab for newsletter, click on that and you'll see um, more up-to-date information. So, thanks. Great. Well, thank you for all the updates. Sharon, do you have a do you have another poem for us to read at the end of the session here? I do. Yes. <laughs> um, we're all looking we're all looking forward to that. So, thank yeah. you. Thank um, so now um so we're we're here on 94.9 FM and we're going to open up to questions and answers. Uh we have a guest guest speakers here, Representative Govea, Director of Nursing Heather York and COA Director Sharon Mercurio. And this is John Mangerati, the town manager, and we are all available here to answer questions. And uh, they've been rolling in, so let me just look at the docket here and see what the first one is. Uh, this looks like a question about scams. Uh, what What are we doing to help people understand what scams might be out there? Does anybody want to take that one? Representative? Yeah, I can take it, and then I think Sharon, too. Um, so the attorney general has put out um, a website uh, listing, you know, if there are concerns that people have about being scammed as it relates to COVID-19. We were hearing early on um, some scams around testing. Um, so please don't believe it. If someone calls you and says they can give you a test, only go to um, a, a trusted healthcare provider um, for uh, testing if that's something that you or someone in your family needs. Um, Never, and, and I know you, you probably hear this message a lot, but you'll never be asked for any bank account information or social security information if anybody is calling you. And that even relates to the census. And um, I do encourage everybody who's listening to complete the census. You can complete it online. Um, it's really super easy. I didn't use my PIN number. It took me less than seven minutes and I have three people in my household. Um, so it's it's pretty easy to complete. You can also call to complete the census at 844-330-2020. Um, we want to make sure that everybody is counted in our state, especially given uh, the resources that we're going to need to take care of everybody in our state. But even with the census or anything related to COVID, if something feels suspicious or feels off, or someone's asking you really personal detailed information about your bank account, your financial status, um, or um, you know your social security number, and it's not a call that you initiated, don't give that information out over the phone because no government agency is going to call you and ask for that information. And, and if you do suspect that you've been scammed, you can go to the local, you can call the local police department. Please don't just show up at the police department. They are um, also not wanting people to come into the lobby. Um, you can call ahead of time and they will reach back out to you um, and do a phone call to take all of the information if you do suspect that you've been um, the victim of a scam or someone in your family has been. Um, so just wanted to reiterate, you know, those points. I think Sharon, maybe you have a couple other things that you might wanna share as well. It looked like you wanted to chime in, but um, we just want you to be protected um, in, the, in the face of the pandemic. Uh, there are, you know, people who take advantage of any situation to try to make a quick dollar. And unfortunately, this is one of those situations as well. And the attorney general, as I said, can also be a resource. Thank you. You covered that beautifully, Tammy. Thank you. Um, I was just going to remind you that um, Detective Mike Araclio um, is our contact. So he's great about trying to keep people updated on what what the trend is for scams. Um, and I do believe he's going to try to do some public service announcements for the radio uh, that, that John sent out a format for. So keep your ears open. Thank you. That's great to thank know. You, uh, thank you for the question and thank you for the answers. Uh, so looks like we have another question coming in here. Uh, this is one 
about nursing homes. Uh, it looks like uh, this, the nursing homes have been uh, in the news lately, uh, and it's something that we're really focusing on across the state. And there's a question here about are we what are we doing to inspect our nursing homes or understand if there's any concerns there? Heather, um, could you address that, please? Sure, happy to. So um, we have a uh, life care of Acton in our town as well as um, Robinsbrook Assisted Living. Both of those entities are overseen and uh, by the state. So any information of positive cases that come out of anyone either working or living within those institutions um, does go and, and it is followed by the state uh, Department of Public Health. Um, we have been as a public as the local public health checking in with them. Um, I've spoken with the director Christopher Foy at uh, Life Care Center of, uh, excuse me, at Robinsbrook. We've had a couple of conversations. Um, Linda Cullen, one of our other nurses, is in touch with uh, the nursing staff over there just to see if there's anything we can do on the local level to help support them. Um, and the same thing with um, Life Care Center of Acton. Um, you know, we are in touch with them. As of now, I have not heard of any issues. I know there's a lot of concerns. There's been, you know, other uh, eight, um, locations in the state, whether it's a nursing home or even some of the assisted livings where there's a lot of um, people that are testing positive or staff that are testing positive. Um, the good thing is that weeks ago, um, even as an agency doing home visits weeks ago, if we were going into the Inn at Robinsbrook or um, any of the other assisted livings that we do go into, they were taking temperatures of folks coming in, very limited um, visits, family members were not even being let in. Uh, they were making concessions, obviously, if there was someone at end of life. Um, to let family come in at that point before we really had um, the stay at home guidance. Uh, but they, they check their staff every day. They're doing temperatures um, of the residents every day to keep up on, you know, if anyone is showing early signs of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Um, that, that's a great response and uh, we'll continue to do that work. Uh, thank you. So another question came in from a, a resident about construction. Uh, there's, there's construction bans out uh, that have been made uh, necessary by the state. What are we doing locally to enforce those bans? So that's a great question. Uh, so the, the governor ordered a non-essential business closure and also several directives related to uh, prohibiting construction except for uh, very specific cases. And our local board of health actually also adopted a construction a ban for most types of construction. So our health staff are contacting uh, people and making sure they're aware of that. Our building commissioner is doing inspections, driving around town and checking in, making sure uh, that people understand that th certain uh, construction activities are prohibited. And uh, we're gonna continue to do that uh, to help keep, keep people safe. Uh, there are certain construction activities that are allowed to continue. And in those cases, we are uh, doing our best to make sure that they're following the uh, protocols for PPE and um, several other things that are laid out in the state regulations. So that's a great question. And it's something that uh, we have, you know, we're fortunate that we have a good team and we're going to, and they're working very hard to, to address that concern as long as, as, as well as several other concerns at the same time. So we're going to continue to work on that. Uh, here's a question about Kelly's corner. Uh, that's a great question. So. Kelly's Corner is a big project. It's a $20 million project. The state is investing a 17 million or more uh, in that intersection. It's scheduled to go, it was scheduled to go to town meeting. Actually, we were supposed to have town meeting this week where we were gonna ask for uh, authorization to do the right-of-way acquisitions. Town meeting has been postponed to a date that has not yet been determined. Uh, hopefully we'll have that soon. Uh, but anyways, so assuming we have that vote and it's supported by the community, uh, the project will continue. Uh, the state still has a program in to start construction in 2022, uh, in January or, or thereafter. So the project is still on schedule uh, and we're gonna do our best to 
limit the impact to the community. We've already started reaching out to businesses and residents in that area to help understand what needs or concerns they have. And we're working uh, with the school district, who's, who's a big property owner right in the Kelly's Corner to make sure that as we get closer to construction, we're making necessary plans to, to limit how it impacts the school uh, operations. Uh, another question actually is about the fire station project. Yes, the fire station project was approved um, in the winter uh, at a special town meeting and we are proceeding with the design. The construction wasn't scheduled to start until late this year. So as of right now, we're still on schedule uh, and we'll continue to uh, update the community uh, on that project going forward. Another question has come in from, oh, can you, someone asked to repeat the number for the, to call the census. Yeah, 844-330-2020. Great, thank you. I didn't realize you could call in, that's a great option. So uh, I think we've, I think we've uh, answered all the questions that we have. Do, do any of us have any questions? Does anyone anyone want to sing a song or uh, do any other sort of uh, presentation while we're while we're live here on the radio? I just want to share a way for people to get in touch with me. Um, so this sure. is State Rep. Tammy Govea. You can call if you have any issues coming up with or anybody in your family around unemployment or housing or mass health or the connector or anything that's related to COVID or any other constituent issue. That's a big part of my job as your state representative is helping you navigate um, some of the administrative bureaucracies to get your needs met. So the best way to reach me is my phone number is 617-722-2011, 617-722. 2011 and my staff Emily Audres will be more than happy to um, help you as much as we possibly can and you can also email me at tammy.govea at mahouse.gov so t-a-m-i dot g-o-u v-e-i-a at mahouse dot g-o-v thank you Great. Well, thank you. Um, so for all of our listeners out there, please note that uh, this week we mailed a letter from the Board of Health to every household uh, with some very important information about how to prevent uh, an infection from uh, COVID-19. If you have any questions, there are several phone numbers listed in that letter for you to call uh, to get more details. Uh, so at the last few weeks, we've been ending the session with a poem read by our uh, Sharon Mercurio, and we'd like to do that again today. But I want to thank our guests, Representative Govea, Nursing Director Heather York, and Sharon uh, for joining me this morning. And Sharon, could you please close us out with a poem? All right, it, it became an interesting part of my job. <laughs> Rosie Atherton, our office manager, forwarded this poem over to me from William Wordsworth. It's entitled, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never ending line along the margin of the bay. 10,000 saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beneath them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not be gay. In such a shocking company, I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For off when I lay on my couch in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon the inward eye, which is bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. That was a good one. Thank you very much. Um, This has been uh, the April 10th, 2020 job with John. Tune in next week and uh, be safe, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Take care, everybody.